Olivia, why don't you come and start the Q&A before I start crying? <laughs> so sorry. That would be uh, can I get Pamela also to come up on stage? This is a joint Q&A, so any other questions to go to you as well. So we might have had a record number of people attending tonight's event, but I think we also had the record number of shortest Q&A, 15 minutes, okay? Yeah, that, uh, we, that's we, enough we can time for one question. That. If you so know keep my it style. really brief, okay? Um, I'll start with this gentleman right here, and there's a microphone coming around. Okay, and while he's asking a question, raise your hand so we know where the next microphone comes and can bring it to you already. Yes. Uh, my Please. name is Ingen Chala. Uh, my question is, how do you see the central banks' uh, cryptocurrencies? Uh, they have a plan and they are working on it. And how do you see the central bank cryptocurrencies in the future? Um, are they open to access and verify? Publicly verifiable, auditable, transparent? Are they neutral? Are they censorship resistant? Are they borderless? Are they immutable? Are they any of those things? The answer is no, 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 and no. <laughs> and until last week, that was already an impossible proposition. Now, can they make those central bank digital currencies as appealing, colorful, and easy to use as Facebook makes Candy Crush? Add another no, and that one's pretty fatal. So, no, they can't compete. All they can do is deliver the same business as usual, masquerading as innovation, packaging the entire regulatory system that will not be reformed until we all exit. And they're not just going to fail due to crypto, they're now going to fail because corporate currencies are going to beat them even at that game. I'm just going to add one quick thing. Uh, I read an article today about uh, how the, the G7 central bankers are getting together to, to do a committee uh, to control digital currencies. So I think we're safe. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be in deliberation for four years. Exactly. And then when they come out, they will have some rules that regulate Bitcoin of 2013. Totally. <laughs> um, if we could get... I saw a few... In the middle over there. I yes, have the, the microphone right already, so... Yeah, go for it. You have no options. Uh, I'll have two questions, actually. One from Pamela. Uh, I'll start with the ladies first, sorry. So, Pamela, thank you very much for your talk. I got depressed. Uh, so, I would actually like to hear from you, because you're both pioneers, let's say, and your topic is a little bit sensitive. So, I would like to hear from you if you have that number of people approaching you uh, regarding the topic you presented, and how satisfied you are from that. And how, I'm sorry, satisfied like you are from the number of people approaching you, because uh, it's just a sensitive topic. Yeah, um, so I, I welcome anyone to come and talk with me about this. This is my favorite subject, <laughs> is, uh, is death and crypto. Um, and, you know, when people come to me, often what they're really, really looking for is a cookie cutter answer, right? They're like, okay, listen, just tell me what wallet to use and give me a form and I'm going to be ready to go. And what's disappointing is that, or, or mo most people don't realize is that, um, your family is unique. Everyone's family is unique. Maybe you have a crazy uncle. <laughs> Maybe you have some family members who um, are really into technology. Maybe you have some people who are really scared. Maybe you have really young people or a lot of older people. And so there isn't just a one-size-fits-all um, solution. And that's part of the reason why, why I wrote the book, because the book is effectively walking you through what would be a consultation and asking a lot of questions and helping you build your own plan. Um, yeah, I, I, when the price goes up, I get more and more inquiries. Uh, I bet right now, if I looked at my phone, I would have uh, probably 50 messages <laughs> about, oh my gosh, I need to do inheritance planning, can you help me? So yeah, thank you for the yeah. question. Thanks a lot. Andreas, one for you. Uh, so um, in uh, one of your recent in, in the, uh, interviews, yeah, you said that um, the Bitcoin price will be sub stabilized as soon as it's widely and spreadly used. Okay. Yeah. I would like to hear from you if this current rise of the Bitcoin price, do you believe it's coming because it's starting becoming mainstream and used, or that is, again, a kind of a bubble or investing, you know, all this type of... Oh, no, we're in another like bubble. Back a year ago. We're in another bubble. The, the price went up $1,000 in 24 hours. Are you kidding me? Well, of course we're in another bubble. 
And, and if everybody you know who you haven't talked to since high school is like, you're the Bitcoin guy, right? Should I buy? Should I buy? Should I buy? <laughs> I mean, honestly, if you're a sensible investor, you probably go, no, but maybe I should sell. There's <laughs> um, a lot of idiots coming into this space suddenly. Sorry, if you're new tonight, no, you made a great choice to come and talk about the technology. But if you think this is going to be a get-rich-quick investment, that's a dangerous thought. We are definitely again in a bubble. Bitcoin and most open cryptocurrencies grow through a series of sudden bubbles, which eventually lose steam, and when they do, they collapse again. Now, they keep collapsing to a level higher than the previous bubble, so the trajectory is good. But you have to have a very long-term horizon for that. In the meantime, it's dangerous. It's dangerous to your family or your friends who may have a slight, you know, addiction problem with gambling or. Um, poor impulse control or who panic easily. I'm guessing most of the people in this room who've been here for a few years. Um, so today, the price of Bitcoin crashed 8%. Tomorrow's title in the newspapers will be Crypto Massacre. Bitcoin loses 8% of its value in less than an hour, right? Yes, because it was out like 600% in the last week. But that's what they're going to write, and your friends are going to go, oh, I'm going to lose everything, and they're going to sell. Right? So if you have to protect people. This is not a good time to be getting investing. This is a good time to start reading. Right? Um, so start reading. That's, this is a really good time to start reading. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Uh, already the next guest. Okay, uh, in the white T-shirt. Uh, thanks for your talk, Pamela. Uh, I agree that the question, like, will my descendants and loved ones be able to inherit, like, will bite a lot of people in the ass really badly at some point, because they didn't deal with it properly. But I have a more burning question, which is, how will my primary loved one and descendant, which is myself, recover my assets in the future? Does your book discuss that? It is not a book d directed to you and specifically recovery. But can I use it as a guide? Is it, is it something that somebody who has no experience with crypto could use to learn how to make them recoverable for themselves, which could then be used? A absolutely. Okay. And there are a ton of free resources on the website. And I forgot to mention this. Um, on Amazon, you can actually read excerpts of the book. And it's available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook. So you can check it out and kind of look at the table of contents and see if it might be useful to you. But yeah. It, it, it absolutely could be used to make yourself more secure. Thank you. Yes. Gentleman in the front. Uh, Andreas, half of the population on Earth is unbanked or not banked? More than half, yes. More than half. Why is Amazon not accepting Bitcoin? That would increase their potential clientship dramatically. Because they're smart enough to let Facebook have a go at it first. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, last week, Facebook was the most hated company in technology. They managed to overcome that and become even more hated. Now, the French government and the head of the Financial Services Oversight Committee in the Senate in the U.S. also hate them with a vengeance and told them to stop playing around with crypto. I mean, that's great. So Amazon can sit back and go, mm, you go ahead. <laughs> They're doing a cryptocurrency. <laughs> and wait, because in a year, right, after they fought all of the battles, spending millions of dollars fighting these battles, they still haven't deployed anything. Amazon can come in and do something. Keep in mind, they didn't actually deploy anything. They wrote a very progressive and forward-looking white paper. And how much of that white paper survives into production? I would like to set up a betting pool, because I don't think a lot of it is going to get through. Once the lawyers have shredded it, the MBAs have shredded it, the corporate headquarters of Facebook have shredded it, they are going to be like, this is very, very idealistic. Good job, guys. I'm sure we paid you enough in pizza. Now, for the serious people in the room, let's talk about how we take out all of those annoying things like decentralization, a proof-of-stake system, open access, wallets that you can compile for yourself, and turn this into a way that we can pull more surveillance data from our users. What say you? Yay! <laughs> and there dies this idealistic project. What actually gets deployed is, is not going to be recognizable from what they wrote. What they wrote is actually quite interesting. It is never going to survive. Are and there, there I talked about Libra. That's okay. enough. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, Andreas. Hello. Uh, my name is Yelena. Uh, thank you for coming to Zurich. 
uh, here in Switzerland, um, people are very uh, aware of the environmental protection problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently I've visited um, a discussion about the upcoming blockchain law in Switzerland that's going to regulate DLT um, tokenization of the shares. Uh -huh. And 90% of this discussion actually covered the problem that, oh, Bitcoin is wasting so much electricity around the world for yes. mining. And Absolutely. this is doing a lot of harm for the environment and China is also burning coal for Bitcoin. And uh -huh. do we actually in Switzerland have to ban Bitcoin for this or not allow proof of work for this or only allow proof of stake coins inside Switzerland? <laughs> what is your opinion about this? problematic of the of the wasting electricity and wasting energy for Bitcoin mining. Thank you. So it's it's fantastic that we should be talking about wasted energy for Bitcoin. I mean it's the, the whole situation is almost humorous in how misguided it is. Consumption of energy doesn't determine if that energy is going to be produced using environmentally friendly ways. If you want to deal with the environmental impact of energy, you deal with the production of carbon and you tax that or you price it so that it becomes unaffordable for Bitcoin miners and they move to even more renewable energy sources, which they're already moving to, because it's actually more profitable. Coal is too expensive. It's far too expensive. Do you know what's cheaper than energy produced by coal? Energy that cannot be consumed at the point of production and therefore is completely wasted. The price for that is near zero. And that's where the miners want to go. And that's usually alternative energy sources that are located in rural areas that don't have distribution networks. You know, like the Alps. Um, so, in fact, what you could be doing is you could be subsidizing alternative energy right here in Switzerland by saying, it's not proof of work that's the problem, it's production of carbon that's the problem. So let's say if you produce Bitcoin by consuming a, a system of energy that produces carbon, we're just going to tax you on the carbon. Problem solved. Done. But if we start taxing carbon, we'll have to notice that 10 or 15 industries with very friendly household names and of course all of the world's militaries happen to be the largest producers of carbon on the planet and if we try to tax them well, they're probably going to assassinate us or uh, or at least make sure we never get elected again so politicians are very smart right they're like pay no attention to the department of defense bitcoin is using energy um, <laughs> It's complete and utter bullshit, and it doesn't even deserve a serious consideration. So, okay, um, just one thing. Are, are there any questions from the audience at the top? I, I don't want to leave anyone. Highlanders. Else. Okay. Speak now. Okay. Is it possible for us to get a, a microphone to, to the top, and then we can take this question first? Hi, Mr. Antonopoulos. Uh, sorry, Antonopoulos. My name is JFK. Hello. I have a very interesting question. He just said his name was JFK. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have an interesting question, and I had a lot of thoughts about it. What happens if we arrive at 21 million bitcoins, but the transaction fees won't get the blockchain alive? You know what I mean? Yes, nothing happens. And here's why. This question comes up a lot, and it's a question that a lot of people give a lot of thought to. Part of the reason is, and there's a couple of things in Bitcoin where because we have this very deterministic um, plan, because we know exactly what's going to happen, people focus on some very specific numbers. For example, 51% attack. Like, What happens is there's a 51% attack against Bitcoin? Nothing. Not, not really. Nothing happens. Um, but more importantly, you know, what happens if there is a 1% attack against the world economy? Um, people focus on the fact that 2140, the 21 million Bitcoin are done. So what happens on that day? That is a bit like asking, will I become an adult within the first 30 seconds after the midnight on my birthday? It is like, child, adult! Child, adult, child, right? <laughs> Nothing changes in those 30 seconds. The process of becoming an adult happened long before, and it happened so slowly you didn't even notice, right? It happened when you were 13, when you woke up one morning and you said, Mom, can I have some pancakes? 
<laughs> you were already becoming an adult. You didn't have to wait until 18. It just happened gradually. You don't notice it's a gradual transition. The decision of how to balance transaction fees versus the block subsidy happened today. All of the miners looked at the array of mining equipment that they have in place, the hashing profitability and energy efficiency of each piece of equipment, the price of Bitcoin and the price of the energy contracts they have for the next six months. And they decided if today they are going to leave all of the machines on or turn some of them off. And tomorrow they are going to make that decision again, and the day after they are going to make that decision again. And every time they make that decision, they take into consideration transaction fees and block subsidy. And when they make that decision, they turn down machines. Machines. And when they turn down machines, the difficulty drops. It's not going to happen suddenly. Nothing happens suddenly. In fact, if you look at it, we're actually mining one Satoshi per block for a very long time. Right? Four years before 2140. So really the question would be, what happens in 2136 when we start mining one Satoshi per block? But if you ask that question, you really have to say, but what happens in 2132 when we're mining two Satoshi per block subsidy? Surely it happens then. But no, really you should be thinking about 2128 when we're mining only four Satoshi per Bitcoin block. And if you follow that logic, you'll arrive to 2019 and go, what is going to happen with the block subsidy? We're already down to only 12 and a half Bitcoin per block. Nothing happened suddenly. This is not an issue at all. Who knows? Like when I first started getting that question, the Lightning Network didn't even exist as a concept. Right? And I kept answering, just give it a few years, let's see what happens. Let's not try to predict what's going to happen in 140 years. I'm trying to predict what's going to happen in the next 144 blocks, which is one day. And so far, my prediction is correct on a 50-50 basis on average. <laughs> so I'm not going to go beyond that. All right. Um, can we do the Highlanders? Yes. Yeah, so my question is actually in the same line. Uh, I actually have a a train of reasoning I'd like you to comment on, and that's um, if... Make it an express train. It, it's an express train. If, if uh, rewards for miners in the far future are coming mostly from transaction fees, from transactions that are competing for space on the blockchain, doesn't that mean that scalability is at odds with long-term value? Yes. Absolutely. Scalability is always at odds with long-term value. Scalability and long-term value are a trade-off against decentralization. And so the way we do that is by optimizing scalability, not once, not twice, but hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. We're going to have to optimize transaction space, signature space, block space, second layer networks. And then once we've optimized all of those and the blocks are full again, we're going to have to start another round of optimization. We will never finish. Now the question is, do you think there is only so much that can be done with optimization? I think there isn't. I think, in fact, that as we do optimizations to make more efficient use of the existing block size, and the average bandwidth and storage and CPU that is available to people holding nodes increases with Moore's law, we are going to be able to do both. I think people misunderstand the fundamental scaling argument as how about we do second layer networks and never do a block size increase? That's not true. Nobody said never do a block size increase. What people are saying is right now what we should be doing is optimizing the fee management technology within wallets. And in order to do that, we need to have a meaningful fee market. And we can also do a lot with second layer networks and signature optimization, for example, Schnorr signatures, and initial block download optimization and relay network optimization, etc., etc., all of which are happening. And then we can actually take a 1% increase in the base block size and magnify it with a second layer to be an even bigger increase in the number of transactions on the second layer. And maybe one day we're going to need to do another block size increase. Absolutely. Why not? So the idea that everybody's going to sit back and watch the network collapse, um, I think is ridiculous. But at the same time, you're not going to see people making sudden precipitous decisions um, because this is a very conservative system. Bitcoin is designed to be a conservative system. But the good news is, if you Sorry. don't like it, you can fork your own. 
And so everybody gets to try different scaling paths. We now live in a multiverse of blockchains, right? a multiverse of bitcoins. If you don't like this scaling approach, do your own, let the market decide. And the best thing for users is, you can hold all of them. You don't even have to sell, you can just keep all of your holdings in all of the blockchains. And then you can see, ah, maybe in 10 years, one of them is going to win. Let the market decide. We don't need to force other people to follow consensus. You can choose your own. How are we doing for time, just to get a reference? Uh, it says, less than five minutes okay. left. And then underneath it says, bar opens then. Which I think that's a hint. I think what they're trying to say is, beware, you are standing between these people and their drink. I think um, that's a fair warning. If we could bring the microphone to the gentleman in the red top. Are we going to do more elevationism here, or are we going to give or the top some hat? more questions? Let's do another question up top next, if we have time. Mm -hmm. Andreas, hi. Uh, my Thank name you. is Athanasius, ending with Oculus. Yes. So we're both of us. Greeks. Opa. Opa. Um, I joined a company recently to create a very audacious uh, project uh, called the Universal Currency. What's the question? What is your perception of an, uh, a universal digital currency and what it will take to take place? I don't think that there will be a universal digital currency for the same reason I don't believe there will be a universal human language, for the same reason there will not be a universal religion, universal culture. Um, or anything universal either. Um, I actually believe in individualism, and I like a broad range of expressive options that all of us have the freedom to choose. A universal currency would be a currency that covers the totality of the world, the universe even, the totality of the universe. That sounds totalitarian to me. Um, so the problem with universalism in currencies is that either people will have to voluntarily follow the universal currency, right? which even if it's in their best interest, if you're a maximalist, you might believe that it's in their absolute best interest. I have news for you. People act against their best interest because they're weird and quirky and stubborn as hell. So they're probably going to pick some other thing that's not in their best interest, but which has a nice logo or was endorsed by Kanye. And so they're not going to use the universal coin, right? Or you have to force them to use the universal coin, in which case I'm going to be the first to fight you from forcing them to use the universal coin, because again, that's totalitarianism. We will have, perhaps, the ability within our wallets to switch coins so fast that we don't even perceive which coin we use. We might even use a different coin as a unit of account than any of the coins that we're using as store value and medium of exchange. A pricing coin that's just a basket index. I don't know. We'll see. It's going to be interesting, but I don't believe we're going to converge. And I think history actually supports my opinion, meaning that we had one, then we had four, then we had a hundred, then we had a thousand, now we have four thousand. So if you think we're going to a universal, it seems like the evidence is going in another direction. <laughs> like at some point, you look at that data and you're like, the numbers are really not going my way. <laughs> But all good luck to you. I mean, if you ma manage to make something interesting, maybe it will be very useful. Um, let's get a question from up top. I saw a gentleman who was raising his hand. Yes, um, thank you. Um, a lot of people consider you to be a Bitcoin maximalist, uh, although in a podcast. Although in a, in, a, in a podcast you said yourself you were not, so uh, that's why um, I will just ask the question. Should a specific token or rather protocol actually solve the blockchain trilemma in the next few months? Would you be uh, willing to take a deep, deeper look at that specific um, project? Absolutely. Thank you. So, so my fundamental position here is really, really simple. This is a system of technology, and technology is fundamentally based on science. And in science, what happens when you are presented with new data is you change your original hypothesis if the data contradicts it. That's science. If instead you are presented with new data and you say, well, but that's not in the holy book slash white paper, that's not science. That's a cult. And I don't do cults. I don't do religions either. Right? So I'm never going to go by the holy word of Satoshi Nakamoto, wonderful person or people gave us a wonderful technology, and now they don't control it. And now I'm going to choose what I find interesting 
and pursue that based on analysis of the scientific evidence. And I encourage all of you to you know, think for yourselves and follow what the data shows. You solve the trilemma. The trilemma, by the way, if you don't know it, is the idea that you can only have two of security, scalability, and decentralization. So you can have security and scalability, but you have to sacrifice decentralization. You can have decentralization and scalability, you have to sacrifice security. You can have security and decentralization, you have to sacrifice scalability. It's a lot of words to say. And um, if you solve it, then you can have all three, which is like combining an agricultural tractor and a Formula One car that can pull 60 tons of hay through a muddy field and go around a NASCAR track as fast as you can imagine with good traction. I don't believe that engineering has no trade-offs. So when you hear that project that tells you we have solved all of the things that Bitcoin does wrong, what they're telling you is either we don't understand the design trade-offs that went into the specific choices that Bitcoin continues to choose, or we do understand them and we're just lying. I don't know what's worse. I actually think it's worse if they don't understand the trade-offs. Right? That's, that's a bit sad. But if they're lying, you know, welcome. There's another 4,000 of you lying out there. Mm -hmm. um, did, did you want to make a point? Okay, so um, thank you very much to both of you for coming in tonight. That brings us to the end of the event. And but don't leave. Yes, so I know many people also had extra questions. They also want to have a drink. Um, the bar will be open, and also they will be doing a meet and greet. So please feel free to approach them after. And just an extra note on this, um, Andreas is happy to meet with you, sign your book, and take a photo, but he will not be able to have a um, lengthy conversation. As you know, the line will be quite long, and he wants to meet everyone. So um, keep that in mind. If you do have a question that didn't get answered, um, you can obviously go to this website and become a patron. And anyway, we will send you um, this link right after the event. Of course, when you came in, you realized you didn't have to pay. This is a free event, so if you do want to support the organization, um, there's, a Q there's QR codes floating around that you can scan and send through money. Um, one more reminder. Uh, Bitcoin Swiss actually has uh, 40 or 50 copies of Mastering Bitcoin and Mastering Ethereum. So, um, don't get up. So what I would encourage is, if you are a developer who doesn't have these books, or you want to become a developer and want to understand the technology, this is the right book for you. If you are not a developer, or you are not interested in understanding the technology, this is not a good book for you. So please do not jump up and rush over there. It's just first come, first served, and you are going to have to find where they have the books. I won't point you in that direction. So start hunting. Okay, let's give our um, speakers a round of applause. Thank you.